Hi, I'm Christina O'Neill, Editor-in-Chief of WSJ Magazine. I'd like to welcome you to The One with Academy Award-winning actor and producer, Nicole Kidman. Back in March, I was lucky enough to see an advanced peek of Nicole's new HBO series, The Undoing. It's a gripping thriller about a marriage, a mother, and a mystery. We immediately wanted to put her on the cover and were able to photograph her and interview her in Nashville. In retrospect, just under the wire for our May cover and our new feature, The One. To celebrate the release of The Undoing, I wanted to do something special to mark Nicole's powerful performance. I caught up with her to discuss the show, the pandemic, and what she's working on these days. And now, the one and only Nicole Kidman. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a while since we last caught up with you when you were on the cover of WSJ Magazine back in May. A lot has changed in the world. Mm -hmm. Since How we shot you? the cover, particularly. Yeah. Right? That was the um, last shoot we did in person before lockdown. Was just, it? Just under the wire, yeah. Yeah, it was the last shoot I did as well. I loved it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's hard to take a bad picture of you. <laughs> no, you can. I, on an iPhone and delete. Oh, I, I, well, I send a lot to trash. <laughs> so how are you guys doing? You're in Australia now. Yeah, we're um, shooting a show here, which is an extraordinary thing to say. But yeah. we are shooting with um, a lot of um, actors from all over the world. And we've all come to Australia to shoot this book that was um, called Nine Perfect Strangers that Leanne Moriarty, who wrote um, Big Little Lies, yeah. wrote. And it's, um, yeah, so we're, sh we're shooting it here. And it's actually going, going really well, quite smoothly. But I always say that with trepidation just because everything yeah. can come so What's quickly. What's the bubble like? <laughs> The bubble is um, once we've we got used to it. At the first sort of couple of weeks, it was it was really odd, um, you know, just masked and we test and there's you know all the the union protocols and then just the absolute sort of diligence to keep everybody safe, yeah, crew and cast and we've managed to do it. We've been shooting since August, beginning of August. Amazing. We've still got to make it to the end of December, so you know we're we're doing we were, it. We we're meant got to a be lot of people in right? We were we weren't sure. I mean, it was actually originally set in Australia, um, and then Melissa's schedule was like, well, maybe I can't. And so she, we hadn't actually bought done anything in terms of locations, so we were in that weird limbo, which is why we could move so quickly. Um, and because of the situation with um, shooting, there was just we were going to have to shut everything down and just tell everyone they didn't have a job. And and then we suddenly went, well, it was set in Australia, so maybe we can set, you know, maybe Melissa would want to come, Melissa McCarthy would want to travel there, and maybe we can get the whole cast, people from New York and England and all over the place have come, um, and Australians, and maybe we can make, a global show during the pandemic. It's incredible. So it's, it's astounding. Yeah, you're one of the few crews working. I think we're the only television show in terms of a limited series that will have, by the time we finish, been working for almost six months with no shutdown. Congratulations. The well, we haven't, done, we haven't done it yet. Yeah. So well, I'm always... Listen, you're, really December will be here. I mean, time is kind of a, a strange and wonderful thing these days. December will be here before we know it. But yeah. what's it like having, having Keith and the kids there? It must be nice on the one hand to be in Australia, but the, the family pressures of, of being in your home, t in home country must be real. Well, we're, I mean, we consider ourselves sort of both. We're in, you know, we have, we live in Tennessee and, um, and so where my mom lives here and my sister lives here and obviously Keith and I 
grew up here and we're Australian. And but I was born in Hawaii, so and my girls were born in Nashville. So we're sort of, you know, our cats and our dog are um, are in uh, Nashville right now. That's causing a lot of strain because everyone wants to see them. Yeah, do you zoom? We're that family. <laughs> where we're so attached. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the pets are like, um, so there's a lot of um, yearning and missing, but my mom is 80 years old and and um, we had to be here for her. That was also part of it. We couldn't just, usually I can just get on a plane and get back to her. Yeah. And we had to come home and be in Australia so we could be with her. Very important right now. Yeah, that must be special to be able to sort of work and have family and have that support and that connectivity. I feel like right now. Yeah, I just, I just, it's been so, it's been so hard for so many families, I think, because of that sense of, I can't see my family and I, I so relate to it. It's so difficult. Um, So that's a huge blessing that we're, you know, we're able to, um, put the production and, and I'm able to now, like after I do this, I'm heading over there with her. She said, bring me a chicken wrap and a flat white. <laughs> so I'm heading over with a chicken a wrap and a dog. flat white. <laughs> yeah. Yes. To sit there and just talk to her and, you know. That's great. So. And how are the girls doing? Inquiring moms want to know how is homeschooling going? No, they're in school here. Oh, in school here. Yes. Yes. Oh, you're lucky. So lucky. They yeah. were out of school for six months. Um, obviously, it was over summer break as well, but you, there were no camps. You know, we go, um, our girls go to camp, and that was a huge loss for them because any American family knows that camp is so much a part of um, so many kids' lives. So we just were, you know, we were pulling things together. But when we got here, the... Um, the school that we're enrolled in, we have, um, they were able to get us into and it was incredible just for them to be around other kids because I think that's probably what everyone's noticing is the, the need for that socialisation. Yeah. The friends, the friends are everything, especially when you're 12. Yeah, I have a 13-year-old, right? so yeah. I know I know very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Building your tribe. <laughs> yeah, and how's Keith? <laughs> he's good he's yeah. good he released his album the speed of now part one um and his song with pink is like one too many i don't know if you've heard it but it's really good <laughs> um that's how um you know and the album he put so much work into he actually put a lot of he did a lot of work on it when we were in lockdown which was interesting because he has a studio in the house and he went in and he was working um really really hard on you know producing and mixing the tracks and yeah. I'm actually not sure of all the exact jargon but anyway he pulled it together and he got it out it's different releasing things obviously now in this in this time and how do you do it but look we're doing we're oh. releasing the undoing so um yeah, so, we're doing it so it airs very soon and um the role of Grace Fraser is such a dynamic character I mean she's yes. really um I mean the show itself is just so gripping and your portrayal of her is just so intense um tell me what drew you to the character of Grace well David E. Kelly gave me um the, the first two episodes and said you know this is the character which I think is very suited to you um and I read it overnight read both the apps and called my producing partner um, pair and just said oh my gosh and we both went what this is this is so good and um so we called David the next day and then immediately went into um and then um Bruna Papandre came on as well and um we went back to David and um said let's let's move forward and off off we went <laughs> and HBO stepped in and was so supportive and have been really a fantastic home for this and and they subsequently went and um and we made an offer to Susanna Beer who said yes 
which is all of that is very unusual. And Susanna Bear is fantastic. Yeah, I'm so excited. to have her step in and do all six hours, I mean, she's such a, a a force of talent, and she has just sort of molded this, and and she and David have have created this sort of hopefully addictive, compelling series, limited series. Yeah, you weren't still exhausted yeah. from playing Celeste <laughs> to go from no, one to I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone always gets timelines on shows mixed up because, you know, when they come out, they're yeah. sort of sometimes they're held. And so, no, I'd long left Celeste, but, um, but, in, but I, you know, it's just a joy when you have a writer who's, who's, um, who you just get and who you can speak um, their, their you language. you turn to the same collaborators. You've worked with David E. Yeah. Kelly three times, right? Yes. Well, and four, because the show here is the four. Oh, so four, and then you've worked with Baz, obviously, oh, a few yeah. times. Yeah, and four times, it's crazy. Yeah, Baz, Jane Campion. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I like that. It's comforting coming back to somebody who you know and working with them. Um, again, I, I worked with Robert Benton. Um, he's, um, he came and visited us on the set. He did Kramer versus Kramer, but he directed me in the human stain and he did Billy Bathgate and he came and, um, he's a New Yorker. So he came and visited on the set of the undoing and I just felt so close to him. So, yeah, I think I get very close to the directors that I work with and the writers, yeah, um, because you, you share some, you share right? a lot. You've worked with yeah. Meryl now a few times. Yes. We have the prom coming out. Oh, everyone is obsessed with the problem. The trailer got released today and it was the thing that like went up on the group thread at, at both work and on my personal text. It is. Like pinging it around. There's a lot of oh, excitement. Yeah. It's, yeah. Who, well, who that, that is so you? fun. That, sh- that, that film is so fun. So of, of um, you, I hope. Meryl and James and Andrew, who would yeah. be dancing with the stars? Oh, ah, Andrew and James. But Meryl would give them a run for their money and I'd come in last. <laughs> you look pretty good. And you sang the song, right? The intro song, Dream a Little Dream for Me? For- yeah, to the undoing, to the undoing, yeah. Which is mm-hmm. awesome. Is that the first time you've sort of sung like, since Satine? Um... I mean, I've never sung the credits on anything. So I was, when Susanna asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, actually, that's okay. I was a little hesitant because I, I still don't have, I just don't have a lot of confidence vocally, you know. I, it's, I'm, I'm far more confident when I just act. But the idea of exploring all of those things and dancing and, I mean, I, I said, okay. And I always try to, whenever I feel <gasps> recoil or fear and I go, oh, this is going to be too hard, I do always try to push through that emotion and that feeling because it bode me well. Sometimes I've fallen flat on my face. <laughs> um, but, hey, you fall flat on your face and you get back up. And You're then you go, oh, well, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad to fall. I mean, it really hurt, but I can get back up. Um so I kind of try to always push through those those things. So I was scared to sing it, and then Keith took me downstairs into his little studio. It was in the during the lockdown, and and we put on some candles and we recorded, and it was really fun. And then we sent it off, and they did their magic on it, and there it is. No, it's wonderful. As soon as I heard it, I was like, because oh, you haven't <laughs> I even heard you sing like that since really, Rose, really. <laughs> so it, I think it's very exciting, and it's like a, a fun kind of surprise. Yeah, that's probably why Susanna. I mean, I, you know, I get devoted to directors, so they can basically ask me to, I don't know, walk through fire, and I'm like, okay, I'm. But it's also such a um, contrast because you don't imagine Grace having like singing is such a release and such an outlet. You don't think of her that it doesn't really connect with her character. No, it's more just though the thread of her psyche, maybe. Yeah. Um. I wanted to ask you about growing up with a psychologist as a father. Originally, I mean, biochemist and psychologist, so a complete overachiever. 
And here you are playing one yourself. Yes. Um, yeah, I grew up with a, first and foremost, I grew up with a great father. And I always say that. I said that um, at his funeral it was the thing that I said when I stood up and talked about him. I started by saying, now I'll cry. I grew up with a great father and I'm one of the lucky ones that can say that because I think the power of a great father, a warm, loving, good man is so um, so helpful in life, right? So I grew up with that, but then he happened to be a psychologist as well. But first and foremost, he was a dad. But, well, speaking, um, of yeah. so <laughs> huh? speaking of not so great fathers. Huh? Speaking of not so great fathers. Hugh Grant's character right. <laughs> leaves yeah. a lot to um, maybe, maybe. Don't give yeah. away. Um, what was it like working with you? <laughs> I laughed all the time because he is so dry. Have you ever interviewed him? No, I've never met him. Oh, he's. I, I wish I could do every interview with him because he is. He carries me through it with laughter. I become um, probably um, more somber when I'm talking like this, but he'll just like, he just ignites. He just, I just know him and I know his humor and his wit. I've known him since we were in our early twenties. We went to dinner at a place in London called the Ivy mm -hmm. um, with his then girlfriend, Liz Hurley and my sister and uh, just a, a huge bunch of people. And we just kind of clicked and, um, and my sister and I were speaking our secret language and Hugh was like fascinated because <laughs> my sister and I have this <laughs> language that we can speak so we can be understood in a crowd and nobody can understand us. And um, What is it based on, the language? I'm not telling you. Then you'll be able to decode it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just silly. It's and silly. But it, is, it does exist and it is helpful, let me tell you was really helpful when we were like at parties and they were and we had our boyfriends and stuff we would be able to use our language and they'd all be like what it's a really good tip all the sisters out there <laughs> I love that yeah so you met Hugh all those years ago but it never yeah. never and we just clicked you know socially and we have mutual friends and then just always um just he's so easy and uh and and then we kind of that this is then Susanna was the one that said, I want to put you two together. And I was like, wow. Okay. Well, do you think he would do it? And I, maybe I exaggerated and said, I begged him. I don't think I begged him, but I did send a really, really um, enticing email, hopefully. <laughs> well, he well, said, yes. It looks like it, it did the trick. It's like being in the position of having to propose. Um, so I was proposing to him. <laughs> Oh. And was that wearing your producer hat or your actor hat? It was my actor hat because Susanna was in the director producer hat at that point. Yeah. I was just like, I would so love to, you know, act with you, which is what it was for all of these actors. You know, we, we really, I mean, Susanna's taste is impeccable. That is so to get yeah. people like Passes Lily and, and Edgar and um, Noma. I mean, she just handpicked Ishmael, all of them. Yeah. Um, Matilda from, I mean, we, we were, we were very, very lucky to have this group of actors. And then the creme de la creme, Donald Sutherland as my father and Noah Duke as my son. So these three men were just fabulous to be in a family with. Yeah. Some of the moms on the show made me shudder a bit. <laughs> The right. Well, because I because that's Susanna setting her tableau of this privilege, this yeah. wealthy privilege, and and you know, in that way of as she always says, you want to see them fall, you know, and to watch that happen. In the same way, things like Succession, it's just that thing of watching this this sort of rarefied world where everyone's living almost in this really, you know, completely elitist place yeah. and then everything falls apart and you watch it all come, come crumbling well, down. It's even more powerful now. I mean, in, through the mm. lens of 2020 and where we are now, the New York privilege as a character almost is a character mm. in the show. And you really, yeah. 
it's really fun. She had that. I mean, Susanna's Danish, so she had that perspective. Just that was part of what she was, the story she was telling. And, and David E. Kelly, that was the story they were telling. They were setting it up. It was, and then, of course, as all art, it gets viewed differently as, as um, times um, become different. And you then view, it's like when you read a novel and you read it again 10 years later and your own perspective and then also the the perspective of the world all of it changes and that's um one of the glorious things about art you know how does it now be interpreted through this lens at this time yeah um but hopefully it sustains because of the emotional call which is do we ever really know um the people we're closest to which is a very deep fear of of, I mean, it's a universal it's a fear. Character development. Huh? I mean, really, New York can come and go and the seasons can change, but the characters, I think, are so powerful. Well, that's what you hope with storytelling is that there is core um, um, threads through it that, that you eat, that either tap into universal fears or universal joy or things we're yearning for or things we're frightened of or things that we're terrified of. I mean, when those threads align with a vast majority of people, that's really interesting. And I think that the idea that nothing is what it seems and can you really believe something and how much do you want to convince yourself to believe something? What are we willing to do to convince ourselves? What are the most important things in our lives and thus what will we sacrifice so that we can keep those lives intact? I mean, those, those things are interesting to me. Yeah. What would you sacrifice no, for your kids? What would I sacrifice? Oh, well, I mean, it's so, I find all that so late, obviously everything, because that's the place yeah. of a parent. Yeah. No, I think oh. from the, anyway, we don't, we don't have to give, I've, I've no. been, I'm in the, the lucky spot of having seen a few more episodes. So I don't, I don't want to give anything no, away, but. Seen. The fact that it's on HBO and we're going to have to wait weeks in between each episode is like, but you were one of yeah. the, the, the a- HBO HBO doesn't indulge the binging, right? <laughs> no. They're like, we're going to make you wait. We're going to make you taste it and then taste it again and then taste it. And then in six weeks, you will have eaten the packet. <laughs> you can't eat the whole packet now. It's so true. But I, I think people are, are here for the ride, for the undoing, to see how it all, all wraps up. But you were one of the first actors to really embrace television and saw the potential of these sort of limited series and, and the, you know, just the I think, sort of... I think what happened was Reese and I were talking and we'd seen Top of the Lake um, mm-hmm. and we'd obviously seen um, True Detective. And they were sort of the big shows that have, that have broken out and that was... That was it, really, in terms of limited series. Um, And then when the book Big Little Lies came along, we went, this could be a limited series. Um, And because of our love for those two series, um, we went, we can do this. And we kind of, and the idea of having these five women explored over the course of seven hours was far more enticing than trying to cram it all into a 90-minute cinematic experience and so when you read things now are you or do you read them differently just knowing that you have the sort of the scale that it could be a, a film it could be an episodic tv show it could be I mean what sort of appeals to you most when you're reading is it how do you make the decision as to what formats best I mean if I'm an actor and I'm just going into it where I'm not in the producing I just I just acquiesce to whatever the the um, the place the story has been put. So if it's a film, like with the prom, that was a film. That was okay. We're going to make a musical. It's going to be. It's not going to be an extended series. It's a film, and hopefully people will want to just eat up a film at Christmas time, um, in the holidays. So you know, it changes. I'm just so I'm so spontaneous, <laughs> and so. Um, gut driven that I just kind of and I don't unfortunately I don't overanalyze things sometimes I should analyze things more but um I don't 
<laughs> so I just go, I go with what's presented. And if I'm reading something, then I'll talk it with, talk it through with, say, um, Pear, sorry, who's, um, who's head of Blossom. And we decide where we, where we want to put it. Is there a project you loved more than the critics did in your career or vice versa? I remember going to, to Venice with birth and we didn't get a good reaction. Um, and subsequently that film has found its place mm -hmm. 10 years later. That's incredibly gratifying because Jonathan Glazier directed that and he's so talented. And that film is such a dissertation on grief and loss and once again what we choose to believe when we're at our most vulnerable our most raw and what we let in and also it was Harris Savides who shot it who was just the most magnificent um, DP so that was sad when it got so it didn't get the reception we'd hoped but now for it to be discovered later is kind of gorgeous. And strangely enough, practical magic, every time Halloween's coming, <laughs> people are like, I love practical magic. This is um, your week. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, and practical magic. Like, I was like, people are watching and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we sit and we get margaritas and we watch practical magic. So that's kind of fun. That's and I'm cool. always like, Sandy, that's cool. <laughs> Have the girls seen any of your work? Is there a film that they love? Yeah, they've, they've seen Bewitched. <laughs> they've, yeah. seen, um, they've seen a little bit of Moulin Rouge. Um, and then they were like, no, we don't want to see you with anybody else. You know, <laughs> they don't want to see me kissing anyone but their dad. They're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh. Like and they saw Paddington. Some, and and some other very, films that, that you're going to have to keep off their Netflix. So they, saw, they saw Paddington, though, um, <gasps> but they were mortified that I was the villain and not the, the lovely, warm mother of the bear. <laughs> um, so I was like, I can't oh, win. Paddington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we always say, okay we got to come back, um, the two of us, as the villains of, of the Paddington Three. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, so that we almost feel like we've worked together. And as Hugh says, the bear, Paddington Bear, should have been in The Undoing. He can't believe that the bear didn't just make some sort of cameo. I don't really see Donald yeah. Sutherland by having a bear, like, propped in his house. He could have just had him walk along behind us at some point <laughs> on, on that busy New York street. <laughs> oh, Nicole, when we last caught up, we asked you a sort of short series of questions around the theme of the one. Um, right. And I, I think it's, it's time for us to update them again, um, considering how much oh, the no. world has moved on. <laughs> so I'm going to shoot you a few quick ones. What is the one okay. thing this year has taught you? Live in the moment. Yeah. Is there one thing you miss from the pre-COVID days? Hugging, crowds, live music, um, people feeling safe in the world, travel. Um, yeah, a lot of things. Is there one thing you would want to say to your Americans out there um, ahead of the election? Um, vote. Vote, vote, vote. Is there one person that you FaceTimed a whole bunch during these pandemic times? My mama, my sister, my nieces, my nephews. Yeah. Became far more willing to FaceTime because yeah. it wasn't my go-to, wasn't my go-to thing. Yeah, that's true. And I also, I also noticed that people pick up the phone and talk more now. The texting is not enough. Yeah. The no, voice is very, very There are silver helpful. linings that will come out of this whole time. Mm -hmm. And I think that silver linings, I mean, there are a few things mm -hmm. that, that I do mm -hmm. think will hopefully fundamentally change. Oh, the, the 
the complete not taking for granted. I will never take for granted the idea of walking into a crowded room and dancing to music and going into a hospital, being able to go in and see your loved one in hospital and be there for them before they before just be there for them. The idea of not being able to be there and the reality of that is so brutal. Um, and, you know, there's just so many things. But at the same time, we're resilient and I love the resilience of who we are as, as human beings yeah. and I love um, what people have done for each other um, to help each other right now and, you um, I've been the recipient of it. I've been the giver of it. And um, that's a really great thing to feel it and see it and know it. Yeah. Is there, has there been one song that have, you've been listening to a lot that's keeping you going? Um, well, I listen to The Speed of Now, my husband's album, a lot through this. So I think this that album will represent this year for me. But it covers so many different um, emotional places. It's a beautiful album. It comes from his heart. He has a song on, on it called Better Than I Am at the end, and it just makes me weep. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Um, but then a lot of his songs are about hope and joy and, and um, moving forward and falling in love. And then he has some songs that, yeah, it's, it's just a really, really, it's from his heart, that album. And what's the one thing you're going to do as soon as this whole pandemic is over? I'm so looking forward to getting on a plane and going to Paris. <laughs> I'm going to go to Paris. <laughs> I want to go to I want to go to Italy. I want to go to Africa. I want to travel. I want to be able to get yeah, on a plane. You said in our interview that you had never been to Africa. Oh, I want to go to Africa so much. I want my girls to come. I want Keith and I to do it. So I want that back, that travel and that exploring the world. Yeah. And that, that freedom. I don't want to be sitting here on cameras kind of yeah. like that. I want to be able to go, hi. <laughs> yeah. Will that come back? I hope so. It has to. It really has to. And what's mm -hmm. the one thing you're going to do as soon as we end this call? <laughs> <laughs> I have to do some more interviews. <laughs> um, and then... Um, I'm actually, I told you, I'm going to go see my mom, take her a chicken wrap and a cup of coffee. And um, my sister's going to come over and the three of us are going to just have a little chit chat. Fantastic. Well, enjoy your day. Enjoy this weekend when the undoing gets unleashed into the world and, and the rest of, you know, not just this small group here on, on Zoom right now, um, get to see yeah. it. I hope everyone likes it. We put so much into it and it, it hopefully is great, um, you know, as a show, but also to escape for a while, sit yeah. down with your, with your lover, with your partner and watch it. No, it's quality escapism. It's exactly what we need right now is just that to watch something that's thrilling and psychologically, you know, charged. It's, um, I think it's it's exactly what we need. So I really appreciate you taking the time and yeah, and thank you for giving me that cover and for um, doing what you did. I really appreciate it. Um, incredible yeah, as soon support as I saw of that women. Show, I was women. Like, get her. <laughs> We've got to get Nicole. Yeah, but it was really really um, lovely, and it's been. Um, I think that you know, there's a, you're a good group of women over there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank they you. Need to so be acknowledged. Much. Oh, yeah. Very special to, of you to say and, and to notice. I mean, I think, right. I know you, you sort of feel coming out of this is you don't have time for those negative, negative energies or people around you. Mm -mm. And I'm very grateful that you noticed how wonderful my team is. So I know yeah. we all enjoyed working with you and, and being in Nashville that day. I mean, it seems a million years ago, but it was that the day after the hurricane. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, little did we know what was going to happen. Yeah. 
but we've all held on tight. Yeah. Well, we'll continue to. Hug your family. You too. Give your, give your mom a squeeze. And um, we're really grateful. So thank you again for doing this. Well, thank you. Bye. I'm so glad we can make it work. Yay. Yeah. In person next time. Absolutely. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Nicole and everyone at home, thank you for joining us. A QR code is going to pop onto the screen momentarily. Scan it with your phone's camera to upload and share your own personal one sheets on Instagram stories using the hashtag WSJ the one. Thank you and good night.